This is the Family Home Evening Program of the Bernard Knapp Family, March 6, 1970. We're asking Grandpa Andrus, or John Ivan Andrus, to talk now. Uh, as a young man, and advice now and anything else he'd like to tell us. I was born in Big Cottonwood, Salt Lake County. I was born in 1897. I was a 13th child born to my father and mother. I think that Holiday was a very nice place to have spent my childhood. The people there were practically all Latter-day Saints and quite active, had good strong testimony, most of them, and those who weren't were pleasant and agreeable people. The entertainments there were mainly conducted by the LDS Church in the form of home dramatics or dances. When I can first remember, the dances were held in Nielsen's Hall. That was a pretty good sized building upstairs over the Nielsen store and it was the largest building there was in Holiday. But when I, they had, I wasn't in there but just two or three times and then it seems it must have been the custom for the church to want to do their entertaining in their own meeting houses for they put a maple floor in the meeting house and they ceased to have dances or entertainments in Nielsen's Hall. My father told me that when he was young, there was a group of people that would come around the dances. And they would, they would uh, be partially drunk and wear six shooters and Spanish spurs and try to ba break up a dance. But that wasn't the case when I was old enough to go to a dance. There was very little drinking done that I ever saw, and, and they never did try to break up a dance. We always had a floor manager there, but his word was respected, and we had a nice, pleasant evening. Aside from dances, there wasn't, wasn't much done there except home dramatics, and we'd have two or three of them through a, the winter season. And then whatever else was done was would be parties in in individual homes. We had quite a few of those. Our schools were run by directed by trustees there in the community. I personally liked that way of running a school because each each community had the privilege of running the type of school they wanted. I like that better than having it directed from Washington or from some central spot in a, in a state. And I, to my knowledge, that all all the teachers that I knew personally or, or heard my older brothers and sisters speak of were high-grade individuals. The, when they first started school, they had a one-room schoolhouse. That took care of eight grades, but when, when I got big enough to go to school, we never had over three grades in a room. automobiles in that community when I was first big enough to know what was going on, but I wasn't over about 10, 11 years old when they started to have automobiles, and I remember distinctly that the, the county had a sign 
up 15 miles an hour was the speed limit by order of the the county commissioners but even that if, the, if people didn't go any, above 15 miles an hour there was a lot of trouble caused by the automobiles because horses weren't used to them and every little bit where somebody was having to meet an automobile and their horses shy out of the road and sometimes run away with them but most of the people traveled around with a horse and buggy until after I was about 20 years old then there got to be quite a few automobiles and a lot of the boys had ponies some of the some of the boys didn't have ponies but I was fortunate enough uh, there was a man who went out on the Yundu reservation and come in with about 30 head of of Indian ponies and and held them there in that area till they he, till he got them sold and my sister bought me one and my brother who was two years older bought him one and Say their name. Say my brother Willard Your sister, and my sister Elizabeth she was my older sister We had a lot of uh, joy and satisfaction owning and riding those ponies, but we didn't have the entire say so about the ponies because we hadn't had them so very long before they were harness broke. And then, whenever anyone in the family wanted to go to Salt Lake or anywhere else they wanted to go, why the ponies did most of the traveling to take the other members of the family where they wanted to go. on in uh, my father was a farmer after a fashion but he was mainly a contractor but he had a farm that's where I got most of my experience was working on the farm but he had done a lot of contracting and when I was quite young he just finished up a contract uh, building the grade up emigration canyon for a railroad and he thought he had a little money by christmas time and put on a little extra uh, splurge i think playing santa claus he bought me and my brother willard each a pair of boots then i remember he put a, a box of candy under his bed the box of candy was about as big as a strawberry crate it was what they called hardtack candy, and he cut a hole in it just big enough so that we could slip her hand in, but we couldn't tell what, we couldn't see in to see what kind of candy we took out, so we had to take it as it come. But we always had the privilege of going in and getting what candy we wanted as long as the box lasted. I, I guess it must last long in the summer. I don't remember when it when it didn't have candy in it. I, I told you that uh, the uh, entertainments were mainly dances and home dramatics, but I, I do know that maybe not every year, but very often they would hold a what they called a bazaar, and that would last for three days, and that was a, a big event. They had they would have a home dramatic then, and they would have fishing ponds and. Raffles. There's no uh, no instruction at that time. She couldn't raffle, and uh, they would have uh, have two contesting girls there to as, uh, see who got the most votes to be queen. That was another way they'd make a lot of money. The, the purpose of the the bazaar was to raise money for the for the bishop to run the ward with, and so any any scheme they could get to get the money out of the people and make them feel good about it was tried and they'd have a, a fortune teller to get some girl who wasn't hadn't lived in the ward very long had a pleasing personality and deck her up as a gypsy and she'd tell fortunes 
she was, that was one source of uh, income. Sometimes she'd tell some of the bishoprics something they didn't like to hear, but they got along reasonably well. And there was a lot of uh, competition on the Queen contest. There's a lot of money made there. Yeah, the the way the you had to pay so much for a vote. I don't remember now how much it was, but it was ten cents, say, or fifteen cents, or a quarter a vote. And the queen, uh, the girl that got the most votes, of course, was queen. Always when I was young, there was uh, the first Christmas I can ever remember of was held at my grandmother Boyce's home. That was for all of her daughters and their families and her sons. She only had two sons. One of them lived in Idaho, so I never did see him there at Christmas. But her youngest son and the daughters were there in holiday. Well, I should say three daughters. One daughter was in, in Idaho also. But uh, what, grandmother was... Uh, I was only 11 years old when grandmother died, so... And she wasn't able to have a Christmas there. Uh, up until her death, she was 90 years old when she died, and I would think maybe for the, about five about three or four years before she died, Christmas, Christmas wasn't held at her place. Then uh, all the other Christmases that I knew of until I was married were held there at my father's place. But he always had a big crowd. As I said, I was the 13th in the family, and, and our family were mainly living there in holiday. We, I had one sister that lived in Idaho, but she arranged to get back down for Christmas quite often with her family. Which sister? My sister Mary was the one that was in Idaho at that time. And we had... So there was 11 living children. There was... Uh, 11 of us were living at that time. And there would be quite a... Uh, every now and again, there would be someone else traveling through the country that would, would be there with us for Christmas. So you... No, we had quite a group there for Christmas. Sometimes Santa Claus came in with a, a pack of peanuts on his back, and but usually we got along without a Santa Claus. But we never had any Christmas tree when I was a boy. That all developed after I got married. Mother seemed to uh, mother seemed to have a, a menu for uh, cooking things that I never did see after I left home. I I remember in our pantry she would have pies stacked, two or three uh, tiers of pies up about six or eight high, and a bread pan or two full of tarts, and several chickens was killed. And, so that I believe the most distressing time I ever had from overeating was uh, on Christmas time. But I never learned any better than to overeat as long as I was there at home. I learned that later on, that overeating is a very foolish thing to do. And I hope you, all you children will t try and in, the, in your lifetime and figure that overeating is a, uh, something that you shouldn't do. Be moderate in all that you do. After after we'd have dinner, sometimes we the children would have a little time for coasting. But usually, our most of our time was spent in the parlor, where we had a program of. Uh, music or recitations or 
storytelling of some kind? Pa has given us some information, but I'm going to ask him to give us uh, detailed information of his birth and his family. I was born April 7, 1897, to Milo and Elizabeth Boyce Andrus at Big Cottonwood, Salt Lake County, Utah. I was a 13th child. My older brothers and sisters were Milo B., Elizabeth, Sarah, Mary B., Lenora, George, Anne, uh, George B., Anne, Elizabeth, Anne Eliza, Joseph B., Ida, Elena B., and Levina Leone, Willard Oscar, and then myself. All of the children lived to maturity except uh, two girls. One of them lived till she was about two weeks old and the other until she was about two and a half, three years old. I don't know very much about them. I never heard much said about them. I remember when I, I suppose mother figured them the same as she did me. When I was a little fellow, I was sick with a, what they figured was appendicitis and they didn't have, mother and father didn't believe much in doctors or there weren't doctors weren't used much in our locality anyway at that time and after I got well mother I heard mother telling someone about it and she said that uh, one night she said well I've done all that I can do I'll have to leave it up to the Lord and the next morning I was better. Lenora and Ida were the two girls that died in infancy. I'd like for you to tell us about uh, the different homes that you lived in. Well, the first home I lived in was the one that Father started out to build within about two years after he was married. When he first was married, uh, he he and mother went to live over at uh, what they call Dry Creek. That's I think they call it Crescent now. I'm not certain as to that, but it was a halfway house that grandfather had between Salt Lake and Provo, and they lived there for I think it was about two years, and then he came to Holiday to live, and and the house that that uh, was standing when I was born had been added two couple of times but the the original that he had there was a part of the house then the, when, when I was in about a freshman in high school they tore that down and built built a brick building that's standing today that's all the house I lived in except well, I lived with Joseph for one winter before I was married I uh, that was at Marion, Summit County, Utah. Tell us about your homes in Marion before and after you were married. Well, I lived with Joseph before I was married for one winter. And then I went to the Army. Well, one winter and one summer, the long September, I went to the Army. Then when I come back, I lived with him then for a little while, and then after I was married, I went to live with live where Lyle Lemon lives. That's in Marion. I lived there for a while. Then I went down and lived in a house that Cy Mitchell had sitting on his mother's property across the road from where my brother Willard lived. I lived there for a while and I moved over with the Julie Wilson home. That was 
James A. and uh, Wally Wilson Holmes' mother lived there till I finally got fixed where I thought I had enough lumber. My father told me if, if I would get some lumber, he'd get the cement and help me build a house. Then I built the house upon the place that I spent the rest of my life on while I lived in Marion. Now you said the Lyle Lemons house, that'd be the one just across from the feed plant, wouldn't it? That's right. And the, uh, the, the one across from the road from your brother Willard, uh, Cy Mitchell's house, that'd be down on the south end of Marion, almost to Camus? That's right. Where Rock Hills live. Well, then where, I don't know where the Wilson home place was. Well, that? that was just across the road, uh, n n north. East. No, just across the road north from the one where Mitchell's lived. Oh. Or across the road east from where, where Will Myrick lived. There's four, there was a four corner there and a house on each corner. Okay, now tell us some of your childhood memories. Well, I've told you about the bazaars and the dances and home dramatics. The home dramatics were uh, something that I did enjoy very much. Not only our own ward, but uh, other wards would come uh, when they had one that they'd used in their own uh, ward, then they'd go around till they couldn't sell the tickets anymore, I suppose, but sometimes the neighboring ward would come to our ward to the home dramatic. I remember Sugar House coming to our ward, and they uh, was they had a, a sort of a musical. D they did more singing than d they did in most of them anyway. And I I never did forget what I heard the girls sing. They said uh, when when the the chorus in the song they sang was, "You don't know how much you have to know in order to know how little you know." Then I can remember the Granite High School had a play they put on at the granite then they took it well I don't know if they put on the granite they didn't have any place that time it was just a little school but they took it around to different places to play it but they brought it to the holiday ward that was the ward that the principal lived in and maybe that was the place he'd come to first I don't know but it was a very good rendition of Jan Janssen see the there wasn't very much uh, importance to basketball or football when I was a boy there in our area, but baseball was quite important. We had uh, two or three swimming holes there so we could swim. All the swimming was done in the creek. We didn't do anything in any concrete ponds like they have nowadays. We had quite a bit of uh, enjoyment riding horses and and one thing that I remember very well as being something that I thought was yes one of my best experiences was to go up Lambs Canyon my father had a section of ground up in the head of Lambs Canyon and I was taken up there for uh, probably two weeks at a time in the summer a few times my father would go up there to cut logs, haul them down to a sawmill at, down the canyon a few miles, and then they, after they sawed up, then he took the lumber into Salt Lake City and sold it, so that it made a nice chance for him to take his family, as many of them as could be spared from the place in Holiday, and take them up there to, for their enjoyment and his enjoyment too, I suppose. I talk about Holiday, now that wasn't... There was no such thing as holiday. Holiday was give the big cottonwood was the place where I was born, but later they changed it, the name to holiday. So I've been talking about holiday all the time when I should have been saying big cottonwood. It wasn't changed to, to big cottonwood till I was about uh, oh I don't know 12, 14 years old probably. I remember very well. Go, hooking my horse in the cart one night, my brother Joseph had taken a couple of colts that he was 
trying to break, and he, he was gone over to to see his uh, intended wife, and she had a little sister that I could get her to come and ride with me if I wanted to. I, I'd get her on behind me on my pony, or I could get her in the cart. And this night I got in the cart, and he had a group of them in, in a three-seated rig, and I told her that I could, my horse could out-trot the ones he had, and I was uh, going to sh show him up, and so I was going along with the very best I could do, but I couldn't quite pass him. I was working on it quite intensively and uh, run off the end of a culvert with one wheel. Now, if anybody knows what a cart's like, uh, they had... It wasn't a very big seat, but two people could get in it if they sat close enough. And then it had sort of a basket down below the single tree for your feet to go into. Well, when I run into that, I run off the end of that culvert, why, me and the little girl went down in the bottom. Of course, I didn't know I was little, and I didn't know she was little, but the rest of them had quite a laugh on us. I felt little then, anyway. I'd like you to tell us a little bit more detail about Lambs Canyon, some experiences you remember up there. Well, I was quite young when I went up there, but I wasn't so young, but I had heard a few bear stories, and after it would get dark at night, I stayed in the cabin. But we were either hunting a cow to get some milk from, or else we were hunting horses, it seemed like, about every day. and. One time, I was out with Joseph and, and Reddy, and I think maybe they'd give me the slip, but anyway, I don't know whether I lost them or whether they lost me, but it wasn't very long until I found I was alone anyway, and we were up in the t tall timber, and of course, all I knew that was up there was bears, and I was quite a little ways from the cabin, so I started to cry. But I was big enough then, I was ashamed to be crying, but. I was so scared I couldn't help it anyway. So they let me cry about as long as they dared, I guess, and then they come around the brush and took me down to camp. Then I remember one night, my sister Leon was about five years older than I was, and one night she come into the cabin just as fast as about as a bolt of lightning could, and the one was the matter of her, she said that Joseph had had her up on the hill they had a big swing up there. That was the biggest swing I'd ever seen. They'd put it up into a couple of big, tall, quaking aspens. And he got her swinging right good and then yelled bears and run to the house, run to the cabin. So as soon as she could get slowed down, she was quite a little ways behind him, And but she got out of there as fast as she could and come down <laughs> the, the hill. When I was young, there in uh, Big Cottonwood, every year we would have sleigh riding. It don't seem to be that way in, nowadays, but it used to be then we'd always have sleigh riding and skating. And I had always had a chance to hook up horses and go sleigh riding, and I had my father got me some skates when I was quite young so that I was well supplied to take care, uh, equipped to take care of myself that way, and uh, and my brother Willard was there to help me in em anything that I couldn't think of to do. He he was two years older and had it all thought out, and Austin Taylor lived close to us. He was about uh, nine months older than Willard, so that we had had easy to f get out and go sh sleigh riding. And the girls were always ready to go sleigh riding with us. So we had quite a few nights that we spent that way. We, that was a, when I was talking about sleigh riding, that was a bob sleigh. I was just going to ask you if you, uh, that meant you hooked your horses on it and went, or were you coasting downhill? But I guess you hooked the team on, huh? Yeah, we always rode with the team. Where would you go, around the streets, or...? Oh, you could go. It was sleigh riding anywhere in that in that country then. Did you get a whole bunch of kids and go in one sleigh, or did y'all take your? Oh, own? well, we always loaded the sleigh at night. Hmm. 
or afternoon, whenever we went. Okay. Go ahead and tell me something else then. Um, I, I remember you used to tell us about a guy named Lou Young. Can you tell me who he was and tell me something about him? Well, uh, he was uh, one of Ernest Young's sons. Was, Ernest was a son of Brigham Young. Something went wrong. He, he got a severe sickness, and it uh, stopped the growth of his brain. It seemed like when he was three years old, and they, had, they spent a lot of money trying to do something for him, but they couldn't do anything to get him developing normally, and uh, he was quite a bother to him in Salt Lake City, and my father was a close associate of uh, N.W. Clayton. He married Ernest Young's widow. She only had, I think she only had three children when Ernest Young died, and then she married N.W. Clayton. So he, they got uh, the folks to take Lou Young out to our place. He was a big, fine-looking fellow, but he—he uh, didn't. He only had a child's mind. He didn't cause us very much trouble out there. Sometimes he'd get me and squeeze me between his knees till I thought he'd kill me. But I seemed to survive it. Uh, Lou caused quite a little excitement sometimes. Uh, there was a lot of quail hunting done around there, and one time the president of our stake, Frank Y. Taylor and Anthony W. Ivins, I don't know who else they were, they were the only two that I knew, but New Gunny was showing them what, what a fine gun he had, and it was an automatic affair, and, and it, it discharged accidentally and shot through the barn and Lou Young was in there th throwing down hay for the horses but it so happened he was up higher than the the gun penetrated the barn but it scared him he soon was out of there to see what was going on but he got the spirit of hunting anyway and my brother George had made when he was a boy had made himself a wooden gun so Lou was allowed to have this wooden gun and he would uh, go tromping around this road looking for quail, and every little bit he'd take get to take aim and yell bang. And uh, if strangers were around there and they didn't know that he had a wooden gun, it looked, from a distance it looked like a real gun, and he he caused a little trouble that way. But that was about the only trouble I remember of that he caused. But I I would. Uh, I'd like to tell you more about my uh, experiences there. My father was the bishop, and there weren't any telephones in the country at that time. And then finally he got one, but that made more riding than ever because if folks had always phoned him and have him send a message out. So with taking the cows to the pasture and delivering telephone messages and running his bishop errands, and taking care of a little band of horses that he had, pastured about two and a half miles from our home, and taking care of a small uh, herd of beef stock that he used to run on the range up there in Lambs Canyon. It made me, so he, either I was uh, riding a horse or else I was pulling weeds out of the garden and wishing I was riding a horse but I got to ride a horse considerably. I remember one time I was counting up the times that I'd fallen off my horse, and I was still young, and I counted up 60 times either that I'd fallen off or the horse had fallen down with me. Of course, I didn't take any precaution. If I wanted to turn them away, it didn't make notice whether the ground was frozen or whether it was muddy or what, I turned. But I wasn't the only one who had that experience. I know when Hoagland's come down from Idaho, and Idaho at that time, when I was a boy, Idaho was uh, new enough that a fellow could be about a, I guess he could be what they call Curly Joe from Idaho, from any, most any part of Idaho that you wanted to be in. And Hoagland's had one of the f uh, fastest turning 
horses that I'd never seen. And my brother Willard was on it one day. We were we were chasing banned horses, and they got into a man's field. Of course, I stayed back to head him because he was on this fancy new saddle horse, and he run him to a fence, and they turned, and so did the horse he was on, but he didn't turn. <laughs> he went on over at the fence, in the barbed wire fence. I remember I cut his overalls and his legs pretty badly. I'd like you to tell us the experience about James Nelson's orchestra. Well, uh, I'd ought to tell you a little more about these, this horse riding uh, so that you'll know what kind of, wh why I didn't learn any more than I did. But I know some of my brothers, I believe, would rather see if they could improve their mind. Ra they would do that in premise to curing their horses, but I seem to enjoy curing my horses more than improving my mind. Uh, but I don't think it ever made me very much money, but it, I got a lot of satisfaction from it one time. There was a man at our place one day talking to my father, and I come leading my pony by, and I overheard my father say, there's my horseman. It didn't mean so very much to me that day, but I got to think about it later, and I didn't have any more sense than to think that if he was a horseman, that was the greatest accomplishment there was in the world. That's that's how I come to lose out. I can't, don't know any more than I do today. Horses are out of style, and and I I'm too old to learn. <laughs> but I I would like to tell you about uh, Nielsen's. I, t I started to tell, or I told before about Nielsen's Hall. Nielsen's were uh, that was James A. Nielsen was the man I, s I was speaking about. He had the hall. But he sold it later to his brother Hiram, who, who was younger. But it still kept the name James A. Nielsen over the mercantile, over the in front of the store. But uh, James A. Nielsen had a very musical family, and he he uh, furnished the music for our ward and for, as far as I know, all the wards around. I know he loaded his piano in the wagon and and. Lodi's uh, orchestra, his uh, players in and head for some place they might start as early as three or four o'clock in the afternoon to get to where they were going. And he was also the first man to have electricity there in in Big Cottonwood, and he lived so close to the meeting house that he thought it would be nice to supply the meeting house with electricity. So our meeting house had electricity when I was real young. Well, I don't remember it ever being lighted with anything but electricity. But sometimes it wasn't very well lighted because it was he something might go wrong with his outfit. But he worked very diligently and carefully to keep the, keep the thing going. I remember one night he said he had to sit over there in his house or in the, wherever he had his uh, dynamo and hold his finger on it all, all evening because if he didn't, he, the, the lights would go out over at the meeting house. I neglected to say when we had that bazaar, uh, we would have the home dramatic. That would be one night, and then the other two, if it was a three-night affair, then the other two nights would be dances. The, uh, when I was young, the, the old and the young all went to the dances, the same dance, and enjoyed themselves together. In fact, I suppose that's how the young people were raised so carefully, because their parents were out with that with them all the time. Now you've told us some about Christmas. Can you tell us about your memories of the 4th of July or any of the other holidays? Well... There was more talk about Fourth of July programs by my older folks than I seemed to know anything about. When I got ready for Fourth of July, why all I can remember is folks riding around uh, with flags and uh, shooting firecrackers or cap pistols. There wasn't any law in that time against having uh, fireworks and. Uh, 
then at night time there was uh, quite a bit of uh, fireworks, but I can't remember much else. Well, you told us that you used to ride your horse a lot for errands. Can you tell us anything else about your chores and work as a boy? Well, I told you that my father was a contractor, and he was away from home a lot. Had been more so before my time than was afterward, I think. But when he would go off on a contract, if he made any money, he said that it was his, his practice then to buy a piece of real estate that might be for sale in that section. That's how he came to have his uh, ground up in the head of Lambs Canyon, and he had uh, several pieces that didn't join there in Holiday. And he, if he was around so he'd get the planting done, why, he'd done pretty well. Then uh, he was either neglected for the summer or else it was handled by his wife and family. And mother was quite capable of of getting me and Willard to work if uh, in the morning but she had mother had more desire to teach us something than just work us she liked us to work all right enough but she wanted us to know something as well so she'd get us uh, say well, now if you'll work good in the forenoon why then you won't have to work in the afternoon and sometimes she'd let us go swimming sometimes we had time to get on our horses and go where we wanted but oftentimes she'd get us in the house and read to us. And she, she had a lot of uh, little books that were called Faith Promoting Series. And she had some bound juvenile instructors. That, I mean, there were, uh, I suppose it was a year's uh, uh, work. I don't know how much they did have in them, but they were a good-sized book. And George Q. Cannon was the editor of all of those that I remember seeing uh, recorded. Uh, and she would read us some stories out of there that I surely didn't like to hear. And they were as like they were just as they were called, named. They were faith-promoting stories. And the ones that she would read us out of the juvenile instructor were written by George Q. Cannon, and you, you know that that's what he had them in there for, was for the benefit of the young people. I can't, I never know when I didn't believe everything that I was told about the church. And I know when I got older and I, I knew that uh, it was a promise that if you'd read the Book of Mormon, that you'd know whether it was true or not. And I read the Book of Mormon, and I never got any any knowledge of its uh, any stronger knowledge of its truthfulness than I did before I read it. So uh, I was in fast meeting one time, and and Joseph's wife, Reddy, got up and bore her testimony as to the benefit she got from reading the Book of Mormon, and then she knew it was true. So I thought, well, I'll try it again. So I. I thought I read it very carefully and prayerfully, but I never got anything out of it, more than I had before. I mean by as uh, any knowledge of it being true, I got a better understanding of what was in it. But then one time I, I heard somebody say that Brother Joseph Fielding Smith, that's the man that's president now, said that if you once had a knowledge and a testimony, our Heavenly Father didn't reveal it to you anymore. And I haven't followed that through as well as I should have done, but that must be the truth, because I've read the Book of Mormon four or five times, and I never have had, I either have missed it or else I've already had it, because I've never, I never have got anything uh, supernatural about any testimony of its truthfulness. I've always believed it was true, and I sh still believe it was it's to be true. And I do enjoy reading it, and I accept it, and all the other teachings that I've ever ha that I've ever had as truth. I'd like to you to tell us about um, 
the di I'd like you to tell us about uh, the distillery that I've heard you mention there in Holiday. Well, that distillery was that was before my time. Uh, I told you when we went to dances, there wasn't very much drinking, and there were the people around there didn't uh, do any drinking much that I knew uh, anything about. But I did hear my father say that uh, the big cottonwood hadn't been settled very long before someone put up a distillery there, and some of the people, of course, liked that and patronized it, but it, there's a lot of people there that didn't like it and didn't want it there, and I suppose they got instructions from Brigham Young to try and see that they didn't have it there, but my grandfather was bishop at one time, and he was, if whatever he thought he ought to do, he did regardless of how it made uh, the other fellow feel. I imagine what I've heard about him, but I think that, I mean, when I say my grandfather, I, uh, both of my grandfathers were bishop there, but I'm, I'm talking about Grandfather Andrus when I talk about that distillery. But the reason I think that, maybe he offended someone because my father told me he was out to a party one night and one of the other men there in the Ward, who was a, a very fine gentleman, uh, was there, and uh, he had his son with him. And father said that they said they would get my father drunk that night. This was a, at a party there in Holiday at a, in a uh, individual home, and my father had a very close friend there who never had done any drinking before, but they put enough pressure on those boys that they got my father's friend drunk so much so that he couldn't go home without help. And before the evening was over, this man who was there with his own son trying to get my father to drink, I suppose got ashamed of himself because his father said, he came up to him and he said, God bless you, boy, don't you drink. And if you won't drink, he will bless you. And I think uh, I got to know enough of my father's life to know that he, he got his blessing all right because the son of this man who made that remark my father uh, was quite a period of his life that he was quite a drinker. And uh, when I got to know him, he... He was still drinking a little bit, but uh, he told it to me. He didn't it for, did it for his rheumatism. I don't know how much, I don't know how much it helped his rheumatism, but uh, maybe it helped him. He he got along pretty well, but he did walk with a cane for a few years before he died. But I never did see my father with a cane, and uh, he seemed to. I would think he got his blessing all right for the, that man promised him that night. Okay, uh, I, I'd like you to tell us about your uh, wives, although you didn't, didn't have two at once. You've got quite a story to tell, I think. Well, uh, it's just kind of hard for me to tell about my wives. If I tell the truth, it embarrasses the wife I've got here now, and I suppose it would the one I haven't got here now. But. Uh, I always maintain that, uh, well, maybe I hadn't better tell you what I maintain, I'll tell you, <laughs> I'll tell you how, how it was, but uh, I told you I was living with my brother Joseph out to Marion, and the stake president said, uh, he told the bishopric that he wanted them to either call somebody from that ward to go on a mission or else them to go themselves. Now, I was there, and if I had had to, had to spend any time doing anything besides currying horses, and maybe I would have been, maybe the Lord had considered me uh, eligible to go on a mission, but then nobody said anything to me about going on a mission. All they come to me was, the bishop came to me and said that uh, they had sent somebody on a mission there, and the first counselor said he'd go if, if they'd find somebody to lease his place. So he said, how would you like to lease his place so that he can go on a mission? Tell her the names, will you? Well, 
Louise says, tell the names. The, my brother Joseph was the bishop, and uh, Elias A. Lemon was the first counselor. Merle Lewis was second counselor. Uh, Elias A. Lemon had been on a mission to England before, but he was he kind of liked to go back to England, and he was going to take his wife with him. The first time he went, he was married, but he hadn't taken his wife with him. Merle Lewis had been to France on a mission. My brother Joseph had never been on a mission. So, uh, of course, that was all right with me. I didn't know any better, and uh, he said, uh, of course, if you uh, at least that place, you better have a cook. So uh, there's only one cook that I could think of at the time, so I hooked my horses up and loaded her in and headed for Salt Lake. The temple was going to close the next day, so I took the the bishop's uh, hired girl. That was <laughs> the I'd been there and I knew she was a good cook. So we we started about three o'clock in the afternoon to go to Salt Lake to make arrangements to get married. And when we got there, I got in there late at night. And when I, I went to go to bed, my father was in the bed that I thought was mine, and so I went and got in with him, and I told him I'd come in to see about getting married, and he said, well, traveling around this time of night, I think maybe you'd better, so. <laughs> so uh, I went the next morning down to see if I could, down to Stevenson's, that was, Cadelia Stevenson was the girl I'm talking about, and I went down to see if she could get her parents' consent, or if I get their parents' consent, and when I got there, neither of her parents were there, and she said she told them what I was going to do, and they said she couldn't get married. So I told you I hadn't gotten in the night before till about 3 o'clock, so I went home and thought I'd go to bed, and I just got one shoe off and the other one untied, ready to go to bed. I was called the telephone, and it was her father and he said when he came home he he carried two mail routes one in the forenoon and one in the afternoon he came home for dinner and found her home there uh, crying and he asked her younger sister what was the matter of her and she told him uh, what had gone on and so he called me and told me to come on I said no uh, no I said uh, she said her mother didn't want her to and he said, well, that's all right, I'll take that responsibility. So I went down, we had to get her license that day, and the next day we were married. Didn't you have any courtship? Oh, yes, yes, that's, she's the girl I had in the cart with me when I fell down in the bottom. We were just kids then, and, and all the time she'd let me why I come around, but... Uh, Part of the time she thought she'd get a fellow that had done something besides carry horses, I believe. And so uh, I only got in there when things were just about right. But I had had a lot of uh, experience sleigh riding with her and buggy riding and horseback riding and going to the theater and at the dances. I remember one night uh, I invited her to go to the theater and of course, I thought the best place to take her was the best place there was in the Salt Lake Theater. So uh, I went down in uh, what they call dress circle. And when I got home and told the folks where I'd been, they couldn't hardly get their breath. They said they didn't think I was dressed well enough to go in the dress circle. But I didn't know that was a requirement. I thought if you had the $10 to buy the ticket, why, well, that's where you could go. Well, after we were married, we got John. He was he was born prematurely. He was seven months baby, and uh, mother said, "Well, mother was there when he was born. In fact, he was born there in my father's house." And she said, "Well, you better get him named quick because he's not apt to live." And we hadn't thought about a name for him, and so. Uh, she said, well, name him after his father. So that's how come John got 
to be named John Ivan. Then the next child was Irma. She was two years younger than John, and then the next one was Edith. She was two years younger than Irma. But when Edith was about four years old, uh, their mother died. And I was a widower for about two years, and then I didn't like that, and I got nerve enough to go out a little bit and saw a beautiful young widow from Woodland. Her husband had passed away about the same time my wife had. She didn't think she would ever marry again because she thought she wouldn't have anything to do with a second-rate man, and she thought it was her duty to to be true to the husband she'd already buried. But she was such a good dancer and liked to get out to dances. I got around with her enough that, and every time I did, I kept telling her how lonesome it was over there marrying with, and how much I needed to cook, and finally she got soft-hearted enough, she decided she'd come over and look after me. And we had, after she came over there, in a year or two we got Kenneth, then Louise, then Douglas, and then we lost two babies, then we got Jim. That, that was all the uh, Andresses we had, but when I got this widow, she had three children. There was Norman, Margie, and Harold. Harold was born after his father died. No, just before. Uh, no, I shouldn't say after, just before. He was, what, how old was he? About three weeks old when his father died. Uh, her children were not uh, constituted like mine and probably hadn't been handled just the same, and it seemed to me after they came over there, it was about like uh, a mother hen going around with half of her brood was ducks and half of them were chickens. But after we had them there a while, we finally got them so that they got along well enough that when John decided he wanted to get married, he was in, in the Navy at the time, and uh, he couldn't think of anything but to come back and get Margie to marry him and then go back down and finish his hitch with the army. And so Margie went down to to uh, San Diego with him. Norman didn't live with us only till he was 12 years old. And then he is so important to the Winterton cattle operation that they had to have him back over there. And he quite enjoyed going back over there, over there too because the things they, they were doing there were very pleasant for him. He still likes to get around there whenever they're going to have a stock show and help them get their cattle into shape. Well, they needed him to show their 4-H. But uh, the thing that they needed him worst for on the start was because they didn't have anybody the right age to show their 4-H stock. But uh, he did that for them. But Harold and Marge, after they came over to our place, stayed there until Margie went to San Diego. And Harold stayed there till he went to school. And well, Margie did go up to Logan to school also. But Harold either was in either either was at our place or or in school or in in the army until he got married. And though and well, he went to, on a mission after he went into the army. John never went on a mission, but Kenneth got his mission before he got the army, and uh, Douglas got his mission before he got the army. And Jim is on a mission now and hasn't had any army yet. Uh, one time a lady asked Susie how it was that we could send all our children off to school as to college and on missions. I suppose she thought with no more, no more, no more money than we appeared to have. 
we never we never got low enough on money but we wanted them to have the privilege of going on a mission and and all of them who could to go to the to go to college Edith didn't graduate from college and neither did John but the army got John he was in there so that and then he got married so he didn't I suppose that maybe that's the reason he didn't but the rest of them all graduated except from college except Edith and Jim and Jim is too young yet to have been able to do all that but Louise and Irma both graduated before they got married Margie went to college but she got married before she graduated uh, I I'm I'm sure that uh, we can do pretty much what we want to do on this earth. I don't know when when we went to Idaho, uh, the bishop there had Kenneth and Louise talk in segment meeting one day, and when they got done, he asked Louise how she'd like to go on a mission, and she said she, she, she'd like to go. See, Kenneth has, at that time had had his mission, and Louise said she would like it all right enough. And so he asked me, he said, if I would call Louise on a mission, could you support her? And I said, I can support her if you call her. Uh, we were, after we went to Idaho, we were having quite a hard time to find the money to make the payments on the place. And so he said, all right, I'll call her. So he, he got her arranged and sent taken care of uh, until she got down to Salt Lake to be interviewed there but what they were doing was hunting for a stenographer and uh, she wasn't fast enough on the typewriter that they wanted to take her so when they rejected her as a typist they told her that when she got old enough she could go on a mission for uh, the general missionary work but before she got old enough to go she got out to Tabiona to teach school and uh, the bishop was when she got out there the bishop asked if about her going on a mission and she said well I don't know maybe I've got a call to go on a mission when I get old enough so she wrote home and said find out if, if, if I'm called to go on a mission she had to be 23 in order to go on a mission and so uh, and she would got to be got that age, but so she wanted to know if if when she, if they wanted her to go. So I asked Bishop Whitehead. He was her bishop at the time there in Lava. But she had her membership out to Tabby, and he said, uh, "No, no, she's teaching school, and she can do a lot of good teaching school. And uh, I think that uh, under the circumstances you're in, you better." get her to help you here and you take her money and use it I said well that's fine Louise is very capable I can use her money all right and she can help here on the place she can do anything that I can do he said okay then that settles that so she told the bishop uh, Bishop uh, Van Tassel out at Tabby what Bishop White had said and supposed that the thing was done and Tassel come down to see Louise, and he said, well, he called her on the phone, and he said, uh, what What about your uh, going on a mission? And Louise said, I'll read you the letter that I got from my father. So she read him the letter, but that didn't satisfy him. He still said, you take this paper to state conference today and give it to President Moon. He was president of the stake there at Duchesne. So she did, and President Moon said, do you want to go on a mission? And she said, well, I'd like to go, but I think our folks are not in financial circumstances to send me. And she said he seemed to pay no attention whatever to her. So he said, you'd give this to Brother Kimball. He was visiting their conference that day. So when she saw Brother Kimball, he said, do you want to go on a mission? And she said, well, I would, but I'm not, my folks are not in financial circumstances to send me. He said, I'm not here to argue with you. Do you want to go on a mission or don't you? And she said, well, yes, I'd like to go on a mission. 
He said, okay then. He said, you save all the money you can, and then you get all the money that your folks can give you. And if that isn't enough, you call on the quorum, and you go. So it was only a few days till she had her call to go on her mission. And uh, at that time, they were holding a junior prom out there, and of course, Louise wanted us to come out, and Irma was there, and she wanted Doug to come. He, she, he about the same age as some of the girls that she were, she was teaching, and she thought the world of them. She wanted Doug to come out at their junior prom. So uh, we went out there, and as soon as we got, drove up in front of the house that they were renting, she ran out and said, I have my call. Guess where it is? She said, it's to Hong Kong. She was so elated. As soon as she said Hong Kong, her mother started to cry because she just didn't think, uh, she didn't know enough about Hong Kong to put what she thought that was no place for a, a young uh, a white person to go to. And she thought that she'd choke to death if she didn't starve to death. And so uh, she was felt pretty bad about it. But Louise was so happy that uh, that kind of offset all of that trouble. So that night at the dance, I said to Bishop Van Tassel, it's kind of irregular, isn't it, to have a girl come into your ward and you call her on a, to teach school and you call her on a mission. He said, I, I never heard of such a thing before in my life, but he said, if I didn't call her, she wouldn't get to go. Now, he had said previously when he talked to Louise about going on her mission, he said, it seems to me that it'd be more appropriate for you to go from your own ward, as long as your folks aren't living in Lava, that's where you'd go from. And Bishop Whitehead said the same thing. He said, if Louise was going on a mission, she ought to go from here. But however, uh, if you get these things as they, if I can tell them off as they happened, I will think to show you that the Lord directed this thing right from start to finish. So uh, then uh, when Bishop uh, Whitehead got to find that Louise had had her call to go on a mission. He, he, see, he said to me, "I'm really upset over that, and and I want to. If you'll go with me, we'll go out and see that bishop, and see about this thing." And I said, "No. Uh, you f bishops are about the same size and about the same age, and if you go out there to see that bishop, why you better go alone. I think I'll stay here." And Bishop Whitehead laughed a little bit and said, okay. So uh, when she was set apart, Brother Gordon B. Hinckley come and set her apart. He was in charge of that mission at that time. And he, when he set her apart, he told her that she would, she pr promised her, made her a lot of nice promises, promises and said, and in addition to this, when he told her that she, she had no worries, go and peace, and there's nothing to worry about, whatever, then he said, and you will get the desires of your heart. So when she was telling me of the fine blessing that he gave her, and, and, with the des and she'd get the desires of her heart, and I said, what are the desires of your heart? And she said, I want to get married and have a family. Of course... Uh, after she come home from her mission, uh, she'd gone with quite a few fellows, but it didn't seem that they were any satisfaction to her. And so there was a Chinese girl come that she'd gotten acquainted with over in China come over here and stayed around with Louise considerable. They enjoyed each other's company, and uh, Louise was quite a help to her to get her oriented here, and she was very helpful to Louise with her high ideals and her counsel and they were together quite a bit and this girl her name was Tsai-Fong Tsai Fong Lee and they called her Maisie and that's what we'll call her call her is Maisie and she was with her up at Idaho and they went into Pocatello one day and Edith was working at the Desert Industries so Louise went in to see Edith and she was working back in the building ways and the, the Chinese girl stayed out in front and while she was out there some f fellow come in 
and if somebody she met down to uh, Provo, and he spoke to her in Chinese, and so when she come back, she said that uh, when Louise come back to where the Saifong uh, was, she said that this fellow was there and spoke to her and said he spoke to her in Chinese, and she said how how does he know anything about Chinese? So she they thought they'd stop and talk to him, and uh, the Saifong uh, introduced Louise to him. And it seemed that he took uh, a fancy to her and uh, soon arranged soon afterward to date her and they were married. Now I feel like that the, that is to, to me is, I want to, what I, the point I want to make is that right from the start of this thing to the finish, it seems to me that the Lord directed everything that was done and while I was out there to uh, tabby to that dance, and when I spoke to the bishop about this being kind of irregular to have a girl come in to teach school and then you call her on a mission, and he said, I, I never heard of it before. He said, Louise told me that you had financial troubles, but I want you to know that if Louise goes on this mission, that I will give her forty dollars a month as long as she's gone and no strings whatsoever attached. Now the, her mission cost her about eighty dollars a month. I said, well thank you Bishop, if I need that money I will surely appreciate it. But at the time I had no idea I'd ever take his money. I'd had boys out on a mission. Kenneth and Harold were both out together part of their missions and we were we had money enough to take care of them the 70s uh, uh, leaders come to see us one night to know how we were getting along and I told them that we had plenty of money to take care of the missionaries and I, it was a joy to me to be able to and it was something that I had a desire to and I had faith that I would when Bishop people said, if I call Louise on a mission, can you support her? And I said, if you call Louise, I can support her. So uh, we never had to call on Bishop Van Tassel for his money. But after Louise was called, it wasn't very long till Louise was, or Susie was out doing her missionary, her Relief Society teaching, and she went to a place and we weren't very well acquainted there, but the lady said, uh, Mrs. Anders, would you like a job up at the rest home? And she said, no, I don't think so, but I'll talk to my husband, see what he says about it. So she came home to me and uh, said, told me that she'd uh, had this offer from uh, her suggestion from Mrs. Wilmore, and I said, no, you don't want any job. Well, about between two and three o'clock that night I woke up and I woke Susie up and I said I'm not so sure you don't want that job but it just seems to me that maybe that'd be a good thing and Susie said well I would think so too that's the impression I'm under so she went ahead and took the job well that made all the money that we needed for Louise it made all the money we needed for Doug it made all the money we needed for Roy and we didn't miss Susie, it didn't seem too bad. She had a chance to do pretty well what she needed to have done in the home, and we were out working away from the house anyway and didn't seem to miss her so very much, and she quite enjoyed herself while she's working up there and had a, she has, still has had made connections there with some of the other people who worked there and some of the patients that are very dear to her. Well, when Louise came home from her mission, we had to go out to Tabby to her release, to, for the night she got her release, and I was called on to talk there. And I told the, of the instance somewhat, and uh, I said, couldn't see in the meantime they consolidated the tabby and the Hannah wards and Bishop Van Tassel had been released 
So Bishop Fabrizio was in charge, and I, so I said, as I was talking, I said, is Bishop Van Tassel in the audience? And way back down the back the corner, why somebody raised their hand, and Bishop Fabrizio got up and said, come on up on the stand, Bishop Van Tassel. So when I got done talking, he called on Bishop Van Tassel to talk. And uh, when I had expressed how uh, well we got along and how pleased we were with that Louise had her call, uh, why uh, made Bishop Van Tassel feel good, I guess. And so when he talked, he said, you know, ever since I called this girl on a mission, I've worried until tonight. He said, this is the first time that I've had the de degree of satisfaction that I would like after having called her when I've heard, heard what this man has had to say. He said, I feel like it, was, it reminds me of the story of uh, President Kimball when he said that goods were to be bought in the streets of Salt Lake for less than they were back in Missouri. And after he sat down, he said, I'm afraid I made a mistake this time. But he said, as it turned out, why everything was all right. And he said, now I feel th that that's, uh, everything is all right. So that took care of us in, on the reservation. Then when we got back to uh, Lava, sometime, one time Bishop Whitehead called us into his office and he said, I want to talk to you folks about Louise's mission. Uh, he said, I prayed and I prayed about that. And now I feel like I have the answer. He said, I'm sure that Louise was supposed to go on a mission and I'm sure that she's supposed to go while she was out there teaching school. For he said, I feel like that as much was known about you folks and your financial conditions, I don't believe I could have sent her from here at all. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, he, of course, being bishop, he had the chance to call Willard on the mission, so he, he sent him on the mission. Milo come back and Joseph went out. He stayed with George for a while. They each had their wives, their wives and families. Then George decided that he'd come back down. He had a, uh, some property in Holiday that he had fruit on it, and he decided to come back down and raise fruit instead of handle cattle. Now that original place there that those brothers were on, is that uh, west or was that over south near Camas? Uh, well, uh, it's a place that uh, was in Marion, and it was right in the center of Marion. No. I don't know how to tell you. It's a, if you know it now, it's a place that Roscoe has. And they, they stayed, uh, worked that place for a while. Then Father Joseph come to me. Well, I should have said that after George left, then they made Joseph the bishop. And he was the bishop there for 18 years. And during the time after he became bishop, he came to me and said, Father said that he wanted to get you and Willard each a place there if you want it. He put you t both on a big place or, he, or get you each a little one. Of course, I hadn't, I hadn't ever aspired at that time to owning any place. But uh, if her father thought that was a thing, why, of course, it was agreeable with me. I liked that type of work. So uh, without me being in on the business part of it, he and Willard went and bought a place of Rube Wilson home. That was uh, the original homestead spot that uh, his father had had uh, homestead in. It. He was one of the very first men to, to settle in that valley. And it's the place now that, uh, that Howard Rock Hill has. We worked on that one together for a while and finally decided that that one of us would have that and the other one had, had, we'd in the, while we had that we bought George's property he'd bought some of uh, 
of the uh, the place that they bought of uh, Bishop Nelson. Uh, it was uh, Bishop Nelson had bought the place that Will Lemon had. That was the uh, there's two Will Lemons. The one that was in my in my time was the father of. Willis and Grant Lemon, but it was their grandfather, if when I speak of Will Lemon having this property, he was the father of Will Lemon and Harold Lemon. And he had over about a half a section up on the east bench of Marion. And uh, we decided that one of us would have the Wilson home place and one of us would go up onto the the ground we bought of George uh, the, on the east bench. And I decided that I'd go up on the east bench. But before I got to living on the property, I'd farmed it and, and lived down in in the, the valley there in Mrs. Wilson Holmes' place. But before I got to living on it, why Willard decided he'd trade his place with Ed Rockhill, and he traded the the place down, the meadow ground down in the valley and went, came up and got Rock Hill's place. And that was the original homestead of Samuel P. Hoyt, who was the father of Joe Hoyt and John Hoyt, grandfather of Wilmer and Floyd and Elmo and uh, John Hoyt's boys uh, there that run the store in Camas. Well, then when you got that property up on the hill, that would be east of the gravel pit in the cemetery there, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yes, that's where it was. Well, uh, tell us about uh, how much you started out with and what condition it was in and uh, that history. Uh, well, it was about 320 acres of it, but it didn't have any buildings on it. Well, it did have a building. There was an old... Uh, log stable there uh, about uh, maybe uh, 14 by 16 that Harry Mitchell had built. He, uh, Harry Mitchell was the original man to live on there but the house uh, he quit living in it and, uh, and Josh Mitchell came up and helped me plow and took the house as as a payment, and he took he pulled it. It was a log house, and he pulled it down and used it for a horse stable. And I think it's still standing down there to Mitchell's now, where where Josh's uh, widow is living. But when when I finally got to, uh, as I I've said before, my father told me if I'd get the logs out, well he'd get some cement and. I had to haul the gravel and have the lumber there, and he'd get some cement and help me build a house. But while I was doing that, I didn't have very much ground bro broke up on that place, and uh, the fences, there's only one fence around at the outside of it, and it was not very productive. And so I went uh, hauling logs in the wintertime. I didn't haul logs in the summertime very much, but I, I logged every winter try to make enough money to pay my store bill that I'd run it at, at John Hoyt's store in Camas. But it took me a few years to get going, but I did enjoy that work, and Willard finally started to work with me. He, he said he wouldn't, uh, I tried to get him to go and log with me, and he said no, he wouldn't, he wouldn't haul logs, he couldn't make anything of that. But he said, I'll tell you what I will do, I'll work for you for three dollars a day, me and my team. So I hired him to work with me and we went together. I, I, we needed help when we logged. One reason to handle our logs, none if anybody got hurt, we didn't like to be up there alone anyway, but we had to pull them uphill so much of the time on the, on the start that one team couldn't pull as much as you want to go out with. So you needed a partner. Uh, well, he went with me uh, for a few days and found out that uh, we were making about five dollars, and he was getting uh, he was making me five dollars, and he was getting three. So he said, "Well, I th think I'll be your partner instead of your hired man." So we worked together for quite a few years, logging every winter. 
then he decided to go to Camus and run the hotel up there and his wife had inherited the hotel and his income off from the place wasn't as much as he felt like he could make up there but we had had some very enjoyable times there we were only there's only two years different in our age and we were living right there neighbors and working together when we, whenever we put up hay or whatever we did we went together and our families grew up or didn't grow up they were still young when he went to Camus but we had uh, nice times together Now tell us more about uh, getting the rest of the property that went with the place. Uh, well, we we built a reservoir while we were there together. We built a reservoir up in Hoyts Canyon. Will Lewis had some property on on the n north side of of Willard's property and I was on the south side of Willard so we three were there all watering out of Hoyt Creek so we went up there and built what we called the Timberlake Reservoir my father was the fellow who the man who f figured the thing out but he got uh, Dan Lewis interested that was Bill's father he was interested in it and we all five of us worked up there and built quite a nice little reservoir had a something there that we were pleased with but then f finally uh, Will Lewis's uncle they called him Illy Lewis I don't know what his name was I never did get very well acquainted with him but he was a brother of, of, of uh, Will's father Dan he had a place up in Teton somewhere Idaho and and it got so that Will could get a hold of that and he left and his father kept the place for a while then uh, when he died his youngest son Laverne got it and he came to me one day and he said you want to sell it to me so I bought that place well before that though I uh, I'd got uh, quite a little more property there so that it made me it made me enough property so that I could run six or seven hundred head of sheep and I was quite enjoying it there with with the sheep that was the type of work I liked and my family seemed to be happy enough with it and stayed there and helped me John did a, a lot of the herding in fact he done all of the herding except when he was in the army and then Ross Robertson come and herded for for us but it's quite a story if I if I tell you I better go back I guess what well, the first after I got the first piece of property I bought after I got the original piece that I first went to live on was from Melvin Taylor and he was a, a a lifelong associate of mine and he he bought 80 acres just west of the piece that I had he got it of Bishop Lorenzo Sargent of Camus. He stayed on it for a few years, and then he got his health wouldn't permit that he do that type of work, and he went back down to to uh, Salt Lake Valley and built on his prop uh, property that he's inherited from his father and worked for the uh, Granite School District. So then it wasn't very long after that till George and Evelyn Lee got to where they didn't want to keep their sheep range that was east of us, joined us. And so they sold us a section of ground on the east of us, which enabled us to increase our... I, I'd, I'd, been had, I'd had sheep there where I was, ever since I practically ever since I got hold of the property but it wasn't very much very many sheep I only had about a hundred head but when I got 
Melvin Taylor's ground and George Lee's ground, it made it so we, as I said, we got up to six or seven hundred. But then I, 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 did I say I bought the property of Laverne Lewis? I think I did. Anyway, he come sold that to me. Well, we were getting along fine then, but John had got so big then that he thought he was uh, uh, capable of doing as much as anyone else, and he got married and started to raise his family, and he said, we ought to have more. We were herding too small a band of sheep. So Clarence Bothart wanted to sell us his ground. So we went to look at it, and I said, John, we're paying too much ground for this ground. Maybe the ground's worth it, but it isn't worth it for us to run sheep on. So Clarence uh, met Frank Knight in Ogden one day and said, Frank, we should sell my ground. He said, who shall I sell it to? And he told him, sell it to me. So Frank come to sell it, and I said, Frank, that's too much money for that ground to run sheep on. And Frank said, let's go and look at it. So we went over to look at it, and he walked over it, and he said, yes, I think you're right. He said, I don't think you ought to, if you're going to run sheep, you hadn't ought to be buying property here. I come up into Idaho, sell what, I, what you've got here, and, and uh, go and buy a big place. And you both of you work together. So I, he took us up into Idaho, and I said, well, that's all right. We, we'll, we'll take the property you show us. It was Lava Hot Springs in Bannock County, Idaho. Uh, I said, that the property's all right, but uh, I can't sell this. And he said, oh, yes, you can. Have you tried? And I said, well, no, really, I haven't tried very hard. He said, well, let me sell it. So he went to uh, Douglas Simpson and sold the place to Douglas Simpson and, and uh, took us up into Idaho. I want to say here that... Uh, I had bought, previously, I had bought some ground of Douglas Simpson, bought 160 acres of him that he'd acquired from High Jensen. That, that joined Joseph's half section of ground that he'd, he'd got from James A. Wilson home. So it really made us a, a lot of sheep range right joining our place. Uh, Joseph didn't sell me his ground, but he, he, he leased it to me, and it was all in one piece there. So uh, until we got in trouble with, with the Forest Service, who uh, the Forest Service at that time was operated by Ken Maughan, and he got into his head that that country was worth more for tourists and for watershed than it was for grazing, and uh, he caused us enough annoyance there that we were uh, plenty glad, glad to leave when... Frank told us he had this place in Idaho. I'm interested in this hay baling that you tell about. I uh, didn't know they, they ever baled hay till they got tractors, so uh, can you tell us any more about that? Oh, well, when I first remember about baling hay, it was done with the type of baler I t expressed uh, to you about with the, the team, but when I was into a class a school reunion that was uh, held in holiday I was there one night and I saw an old gentleman there oh he was between 80 and 90 years old I suppose his name was McDonald I I don't I never seen the man before and I never heard of him but he got up to talk about the first school that he went to in Holiday, which probably was the very first they ever held a school there, I wouldn't know, but they held a school there as soon as they settled anyway. I remember my mother telling about, well, no, McDonald couldn't have been to the first school because he was too too young, because I know they held a school there when, when my mother was first old enough to go to school and I don't know how, might, how much they might have held school before that but I know grandfather, grandfather's wife 
Ann, her name was Ann Brooks before he married her. Uh, she was Aunt Ann to me. Uh, but she, I remember him telling about her teaching school there in Holiday. And I don't know that she was the first school teacher, but that was back when Mother was just a girl. But anyway, I'll tell you about this hay baling. This Brother McDonald said he, after he got t telling us about going to school, then he told us that he'd done the first hay baling that was ever done in, in Holiday. And the way they did it was to have a platform built high enough up so as to a sack could hang under it and then they pitched the hay up onto the platform and then tromped it into the sack. Now I don't know just what kind of container it all was, could have been. They, may, they might have had a, a frame of a wire or rope or string or something <clears throat> or sack but that was that's the first hay baling that I ever did hear tell of. Uh, now that takes care of the hay baling, but I want to go back to this uh, acquiring that property. I had uh, bought a piece of ground from Johnny Lewis. Uh, that's, uh, that joined the cemetery there in, in Marion. And then Wilmer Hoyt sold me another piece that joined the Johnny Lewis piece. So that we had over... Before we got done buying there, we had over 1,300 acres all in one piece, and it was good ground, and we were fixed. We didn't have it was a good winter range we wanted for sheep, but we were getting very, very along very well for summer range. But I want I want to tell you, in all the dealing I had in in buying that ground. It was all pleasant and satisfactory. When a man told you anything, why, well, that's what he meant. And they were just as trustworthy and fine as as folks could be. To, to, to show you how, what I mean by that, uh, word came to me that uh, Doug Simpson had 160 acres for sale uh, on the mountain. And... So I, I saw him one day plowing in his field, and I went in and I said, uh, is your range ground for sale, Doug? And he said, yes. And I said, what do you want for it? And he said, $10. I said, I, I'll take it. And he said, well, uh, I've got it mortgaged to the Walker Bank, and I can't sell it to you till I clean off the mortgage. So you'll have to pay me in advance. Uh, so uh, at that time I had the money, so I just uh, reached my pocket, got my checkbook, and, and wrote him out his uh, $1,600. And he said, when, now, as soon as I can, I'll get you the d deeds. So, uh, oh, it could have been two or three months. I don't know how long it was. It was quite a little while, and uh, he got me the deeds. Well, he didn't give them to me. He phoned me, and he said, I've got the deeds ready for you. But after that, I remembered that at that time, there's quite a little interest there in mining. And the, the property that he had and the property that I had was all had the mineral rights that went with the property. But if you got ground to the the government after a certain period why the mineral rights belonged to the government so I put some value on the mineral rights and I said Doug did I uh, get the mineral rights and he said well I never reserved any now uh, I just wanted to tell you that to show you how how honorable and fine it was to deal with folks that you could trust and uh, and I, I didn't know any more about dealing on real estate th than I had learned there and when I went up to Idaho I should have been wise because when I got up there I got dealing with a fellow that that uh, went about in a different manner 
But when we went to Idaho with Frank to see the place, he showed us a place that was just a regular heaven on earth, I thought, for a person that wanted to run sheep. He had he had about 200 acres of meadow ground that you never had to do anything with, only graze it and fence it. And then he had, well, it was a 1,300-acre place of uh, deeded ground, but the, no, not 1,300 acres of deeded ground. There was only, there was only uh, 1,100 and something of deeded ground. The, when I talk about 1,300, we did buy another piece. Vernon Erickson came up there and got a piece that joined us, uh, which we own now, which made it 1,300, and 1,300 and about 30 acres. But the the ground that we had there was around uh, 11, close 1,200 acres of deeded ground, and then he, there was 1,700 acres of Taylor grazing that joined it that we had a uh, individual privilege on. Then there was a state section that uh, we had the privilege of leasing. You nobody could lease it unless unless we decide to quit. And it, it was some of it was a pretty good place to. That's the Taylor grazing ground was was a, a type of ground you could run on. Uh, Long in the winter, better than we had been able to do in Marion. So we were, we were very pleased with with the prospects there, and we got to sprinkling in Marion, and we weren't getting along too well. The folks were. We'd got sprinkling onto some ground that that was above the ditch, above the Marion Canal, and and some of our neighbors seemed to feel uneasy about that. They. Uh, seemed to think we were going to get something for nothing or else. Uh, uh, I don't know what their trouble was, but anyway, we were having a little trouble getting to sprinkle. But when we got up there, we were, this ground is on what is called East Bob Smith Creek, and we had the sole control of the creek so that we could sprinkle in it any time we wanted. And we had a lot of sprinkler pipe, and it a very much appealed to John. He thought he he just saw visions there that I couldn't even see. He was going to have the whole whole place under sprinkler, which was which was good judgment if we had got the the water like we should have done. But after we got up to to sprinkling the first year and watering them, the water master come along in about the. 10th of July and said turn your water down and I said no you don't turn the water down on this place and he said well I think you do you better find out what your water rights are so we got to investigating and found out that we had been deceived the water was there all right enough but unless there was 150 feet of water in the Portneuf River down at where McCammon took their water out to, to take care of the McCammon Irrigation Company, why we had to turn our water down. And about about uh, every third year or more, we had to turn the water down. Well, after we found out that uh, without going to to law to see about that water we we just didn't have it why well, I went to the bishop and he said hey, go and get you an attorney and see what about it so he told me what attorney to go to see and I went and we got into a lawsuit but we didn't we didn't get anything uh, I think there the, the judge or the uh, the opposing faction interpreted the law different than I did and, uh, and different than our attorney but anyway we didn't we didn't get anywhere and we've been we've been fussing about that water ever since and trying to get a water right on that place to, to get the control of the creek like we were told we did have when we went there 
that, that's why we were in so much financial trouble when Louise got called on her mission. We were just, ab just about to lose the place, and, our, and the bishop knew all about it. How did you finally get out of this financial trouble? Uh, well, when, when after we had the lawsuit, of course, we, we supposed we'd win it, so we didn't make any payments. We had our, when we lost the lawsuit, we had our back payments to make and the interest on it. And we, I went around to try to find the money, but couldn't find any. Finally, one day, Calvin Cole come down into our yard and said, how are you getting along? And I said, oh, pretty good, all I lack is money and I didn't know that he come down intending to get me any money I was very much surprised when that night John come over and said Calvin Cole called and said that he thinks he can get six thousand dollars for us and uh, he said he said for me to come down to Ogden and he took me to the Utah Power and Light Company, but I don't know, well, we st Susie and I stayed with him that night, and the next morning, we went in our automobile to the Utah Power and Light office, and I said, well, you know the way, you better drive, so we were riding along without any strain at all, because he was doing the driving, so I said, well, Calvin, it's awful nice of you to get me this money, but how are you going to feel when you have to pay it back? And he said, well, we've considered that too. And that's all he said. But after we got the money paid back to him, then he told me, he said, I said to Nola, what will we do if we... He, see, he had to mortgage his home, everything he had uh, to the light company, and uh, then they had a, what they call a credit union there, and they let him have the money. And he said, we've, I just spoke to Nola about that, and she said, well, we'll have to start from scratch, the same as they'll have to do. Uh, that's the kind of, of uh, things that I, I think are most important, the things that I value most in my experiences in life it isn't the time that I've had the money to do the things I wanted to do. It was the time that it seemed that the, the Lord come to our rescue when we didn't have the money. I didn't only get Cal uh, money from Calvin Cole, but I come down to uh, Salt Lake to see if I could get some from my brother Willard and my sister Leon. Well, they weren't in circumstances they could do very much for me, so uh, Willard went to his bishop to know what he should do, and he told him what to do, and in, in going at it from that manner, in that uh, method, why, uh, Owen, my nephew Owen Andrus, and, and Doug Pack, and Leon, and Willard each give me a thousand or loaned it to me. And then that took care of all, all of my needs then except uh, I needed two more thousand. When I got that much I was all fixed to make all the payments except I needed two more thousand. And Bishop White said, go and ask Tom Harper. And I said, well, I sure hate to. And he said, yes, I know you do, but you, you go anyway. And and see what he can do for you. So I went to Tom and told him what I wanted, and he he said, well, I'll let you know in the morning. So the next morning, about daylight, here he come his wife and said, we'll go to Pocatello with you in the morning and get your money. And when he gave me the, got me the note for, to sign for the $2,000, I looked at it, and he had 6% interest, and no due date and I said there's no no due date on here and he said well 
you'll just pay it when you can. Well, we were very much blessed, and we got that paid back. All right, and now I, I have uh, neglected mentioning Calvin Rousel. He come down there about the time Calvin, or uh, soon after Calvin Cole come down. Calvin Rousel come down and said. He had a thousand dollars for me. I never asked him about any money. It was a great surprise, but he come down there and offered it to me. Now, uh, to Calvin Rousel and to Tom Harper, it was a blessing to them, I think, because they had their money. They had their money in the Idaho Savings and Loan, and uh, it wasn't very long after that till they closed their doors. And in, in two or three years' time. They, I understand they got 40% of their money back. In other words, they lost 60% of their money. Now, I, that wasn't uh, the only people that helped us the money, or not at this particular time, but we got help from the Camas State Bank. I couldn't borrow money in Idaho at a bank at all, never, never a thing. But, but I come down to Camas and got all I could, everything we had was mortgage, so the only thing I could get from Camas was on my note, but I got uh, as high as $7,000 there on my note. Now, the, the, the reason that I say these things, it isn't to make you think that money was hard to get or was easy to get, it's to show you that the Lord I think was directing the things that we did because I went into the Camas State Bank once and wanted money so bad that I didn't know what to do hardly and I asked Tom for uh, $2,000 and he said, oh, I can't do it, I can't do it. He said, uh, I just can't do it and he went off into the safe and come back and sat down and wrote my note out for $3,000. And uh, I signed it and went on home. And after I got it paid back and I saw Tom and I asked him why he did that and he said, I don't know, I didn't know I did it. He had no recollection, whatever, of doing that thing. Well, but you wanted three. But I, I, I needed three, but I, I didn't dare ask him for three because I, I, was, I thought two is all that I could possibly get. Tell us a little bit more about uh, what you raised there in Idaho. Well, when we were in Marion, we we raised a lot of peas and thought we would when we got to Idaho, but uh, we never had any market for them up there. So uh, all we did was raise grain and hay and sheep and cattle. Let's start backwards now and leave Idaho and go back to Marion and tell about your timbering. Well, the last, about the last three years that we lived in Marion, John was uh, was capable of handling the place pretty well, so uh, Kenneth and Louise, Douglas, Jim, Susie and me went off working for Ike Smith, and we worked for Lynn Larson. Uh, we spent three years working in the timber. We had enough power there that we could get out a load and uh, handle it so that we could get down and help John do a little haystacking. But aside from that, he done all the farming. But, well, I surely thank you for that. And if I need it, I'll call on you. But I hope I don't need it. We've sent some before, and we never we were able to do it with the money that we had of our own. Uh, so she went, uh, She was called to to go to China. We didn't uh, know very much about China, but we thought that was uh, kind of out of this world, and her mother felt that that was more than uh, they should ask of a girl. Uh, worried her for some time, but Louise didn't worry. She was very much delighted with the call. Well... Before uh, Louise saved all her all the money she could, and before her money was used up, 
one day as uh, Susie was out doing her Relief Society teaching, a lady there in our ward said, Mrs. Anders, would you like a job cooking up the rest home in lava? And she said, oh, I don't know. I'll think about it, go and talk to my husband about it. So she came home to me and said, would you think it'd be good for me to cook up the rest home? She never been away from home. She had all she could do to home. And uh, I said, no, no, you stay home. But before I got out of bed in the morning, along in the middle of the night, it, I woke up and it seemed to me like it would be good judgment uh, to have her uh, take that job at the rest home because our family were uh, pretty well married off. We only had Louise and Douglas and Edith and Jim home and uh, uh, Louise would be gone. And So I thought maybe we and the other boys were pretty good age. I thought they were gone to school all day and I thought maybe it'd be good judgment. So I uh, talked with her about it and she said, well, I kind of the longer I think about it, the more I think I should. So we had to go and take the job. Well, about the time Louise come home, Douglas was called, and soon after he come home, Jim was called, and it seems that we, Susie worked there long enough so that we never had any trouble getting our money to send to the boys while they're in on their missions but before she got gone Bishop White well I should have told you before when when uh, Bishop Van Tassel called her and I told Bishop Whitehead that she was going on a mission and uh, he he said that makes me mad that that Bishop I don't think I'd have done that he said uh, I'll go with you out there and we'll see him. And I said, no, you bishops are about the same age and about the same size. If you've got any fight with Bishop Van Tassel, you go out and take care of it yourself. I think I'll stay here. And he laughed and said, well, all right, then I'll stay here too. But before she got gone on her mission, he called us into his office and he said, you know, I'm sure that uh, it's right that she go on that mission. Now the point I want to make there, Bishop Bishop Whitehead was my bishop, but he wasn't Louise's bishop, and uh, he had no business to say whether she went on, on a mission or not. That was Bishop Van Tassel who should have done that. But Bishop Whitehead was my bishop, and he was uh, he had been hers so recently. I guess he kind of thought at the time that. He should have done exactly as he did. But uh, oh, Louise had to go back out to Duchesne to, when she came back from the mission, had to make a report there and be released. And when we went out, they called on, on me to talk. And I said, uh, in the meantime, while she was on her mission, the, the Hannah Ward that, uh, and the Duchesne Ward had been and the D D Tabby Ward had been put together as one ward. And Bishop Van Tassel had been released, and Bishop Fabrizio, who was the Bishop of the Hanno Ward, was made Bishop of the Consolidated Wards. And so I didn't see Bishop, it was Bishop Fabrizio that called on me to talk, and I hadn't seen Bishop Van Tassel. So I said, is Bishop Van Tassel in the audience and he was off down the corner of the uh, room and he held up his hand and then Bishop Fabrizio got him and said come on up on the stand Bishop Van Tassel and as soon as I got done talking why uh, they called on Bishop Van Tassel to talk and I, I told them how pleased I was that that uh, Louise had her call and I want to tell you uh, uh, I, I said we had plenty of money, but the thing that I, I have neglected telling you, when she was set, up, when she got went to get set apart, the girl in the office was a uh, someone Louise knew, and she said, "Who would you like to have set you apart?" And Louise said, "Whoever, whoever comes." And she said, "Well, 
Brother uh, Hinckley is Gordon B. Hinckley is in charge of that mission, and he's here, so I'll have him come set you apart. So when he comes set her apart, he said, you uh, send your experiences, as you send your experiences home to your folks, it will strengthen their testimony. And as they send their money to you, they'll be blessed in their basket and store. And when she said that to me, it seemed to it seemed to me just as though I went about six inches off of the earth. It just it was that, it was that much uh, had that much effect on me, and I was felt very certain then that we would be blessed with all the money that was necessary. So I, I uh, when I was talking out to uh, uh, Tabby at Louise's uh, uh, welcome home. I told them of uh, that experience, and uh, so uh, when Brother Van Tassel got up, Bishop Van Tassel, he said, I've worried about calling this girl on a mission ever since I did it until tonight when I've heard this man talk. He said, uh, he said then he went ahead and told about the time that uh, Brother Heber C. Kimball was... Uh, prophesied that the goods would be sold for less money in the streets of Salt Lake than they were back in St. Louis. And after he sat down, he said, I made a mistake that time. But he it wasn't within a year or so, I don't know just how long, but soon, why is the people were going through to California and their teams were overloaded and give out and they were ready to go over the mountains why they knew they had to lighten their loads, so they sold their stuff at a reduced price in Salt Lake. And he said, that's uh, that's just how I, I've been just, ever since I called her, I've been just like Brother Kimball. I thought I'd made a mistake. But I, I wanted to tell that to show you that the Lord can bless us whenever we're entitled to a blessing. And I had the faith when when Bishop Teeple called her the first time, he said, if I call her on a mission, can you support her? And I said, if you if you call her, I can support her. I, I had that much faith that I knew that if she was called, the Lord would open up the way that we could uh, get her the money. And we were very much blessed, uh, never felt shorted on money to do the things that we wanted to do in her home and always had all the money to send to our missionaries that they needed and circumstances were such that some women as I told you marveled that we were able to do that I'll ask mom that's grandma Andrews to tell something that impressed her about the incident um the thing that uh, impressed me was uh, after Louise had gone on her mission, uh, Bishop Whitehead called uh, Pop and I into his office uh, one day after meeting, and uh, he said, I want to talk to you about Louise's mission. He said, I really felt bad when, uh, uh, I, got, when I had told you folks that she shouldn't go on a mission. And then we learned that she was going from that ward out there. He says, I, I couldn't figure it out. He says, I felt at the time that she just should not go. And uh, he says, and, since, and then after she got gone, he says, I worried about it. I thought about it. And I couldn't, uh, I just, and I prayed about it. It just seemed like if she should, was, if she was going to go, she should have gone from this ward. He says, but I, I've, think that maybe I've got the answer now. He says, I've done a lot of praying about it. He said, um, uh, when uh, she would have had to have gone to the stake to get their uh, permission to go, and uh, the, the stake authorities knew the, the condition that we were in, the hard time was having to make a, our payments on our place, and he says, I feel that they wouldn't have sanctioned her going. And he says, I think that was the reason that she didn't go from this ward, was because the stake would have stopped her. And so 
maybe it was a good thing for her to go from that ward out there where she, where she was. That was where her membership was, and that was her bishop, and he had the right to call her on her mission. And he said, I feel better about it now. He said, but for a long time, it, uh, it just worried me. It just didn't seem right that she should not go from this ward if she was going to go. I think that's all I should say about it. Like there was a hand of the Lord in the whole thing, right from the start to the finish. You mentioned that when Louise got her mission call that you thought that uh, China was just out of this world. How do you feel about it now? Uh, all I knew about China is what I'd learned in school. And uh, all China was to me was uh, a place clear off over in the Orient, and we never had any contact with the Orient, and it was overpopulated. I thought that they were facing starvation every now and again due to overpopulation, and uh, I didn't realize that they were anxious and ready to hear the gospel. I never heard of any, any of them being Christians over there. I thought they were Buddhists, but I surely do appreciate the fact that Louise was called there because I learned that they were very intelligent, industrious, good-hearted people, same as we are in this country. And when Louis, after Louise come back, she brought uh, there was a, a Chinese girl here uh, come here to visit us. Her name was Tsai Fong Li, and I learned to respect her as one of the finest little girls that I'd ever known. She was very intelligent and had a good, strong testimony, all a strong desire to do what was right. She hadn't been here very long till she got on the faculty at the BYU and that's where she is at this present time and I, I've told people wherever I go if they're talking about the Chinese I said you want to get acquainted with them it'll do you good to know what kind of people they are and, and, and since that time I knew that uh, Joseph Fielding Smith was over there in the Orient and he said there were just as good a people over there as there were here I also want to tell you, it seems that Louise was especially right to go to China for she seems to have a, a love for the Chinese people as strong as she does for any other people. And she can speak the language so well that a, a Chinese listening to her talk can't, if they can't see her, they can't tell that she isn't Chinese. But there was one thing I wanted to I uh, thought I should have made mention when she was set apart by uh, Brother Hinckley. He told, uh, he told her that due to her mission, she would get the desires of her heart. And I said, what are the desires of your heart? And I go, and she said, I want to get a testimony. And after I get that, I want to uh, get married and raise a family. Now, she got her testimony. I think she has as strong a testimony as the rest of us do. And due to her going on a mission and having this Chinese girl come back here, it, she uh, got to meet Bernie. It was just... I, I Maybe she'll tell you how that happened, but M Margie and Louise and uh, Tsai Fong were into the desert industries. And uh, here come a young man in there and s saw Tsai Fong, and he said Merry Christmas to her in Chinese. And Margie and Louise said, how come he knows Chinese? And she said, I don't know. So they said, well, go and find out of him. So she went over and asked him, and he said he'd been to Taiwan on a mission. And uh, Louise said she'd been there on a mission, too. He, they didn't say very much. There was only there a minute or so, and he went on about his business. But later on, Tsai Fong moved into the same ward that he was in at Provo, and he asked her, 
about that girl that was with her at uh, the Desert Industries in Pocatello. And she, so then she invited Louise there and where he was, they got to meet each other and started their courtship. It wasn't very long until we had uh, Louise foisted off onto him and they're raising their family now. Now, it's easy to see that the, the Lord was directing all of the things that I've told you here about Louise's mission. I, I want to tell you a little more about that. I had prayed, as I told said before, Mother read these faith-promoting faith stories and the stories out of the juvenile instructor to us, which seemed to me that were very miraculous and and should be cherished experiences to those who had them. And I, one night I thought, it come to me that uh, I never had anything of that kind, no evidence that the Lord had had any connection with my life that was worth telling. And I, I prayed that the Lord might give me something that would indicate that I had to receive direction. And this, soon after that, that this experience with Louise come about. To me, it is it is about as good as ordinary people have. The one thing I didn't say about Tsai Fong, she hadn't been here very long before she went and got a patriarchal blessing, and they told her that she was the blood of Ephraim. That should be, with whatever else I told you, sufficient evidence that that. Tai, Taiwan was as fine a place to go on a mission as there would be in the world. It may seem like all of my uh, attention here has been spent on telling about Louise's mission. We had Harold and Kenneth, Douglas all have gone on missions, and the, the joy and satisfaction received was all that we we're entitled to, and we've always had the money to give to them, send to them as they should go. Harold had sent, when, when he was in the army, sent his money home to, to us. No, he didn't say save my money for me, he just sent it home to us to use. And we did use it, and I think made good use of it, so that when it came time for him to go, we had money to send him all right enough. Before he, he'd only been gone about a year when Kenneth was called. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but the bishop told me later th that he told the authorities when he recommended him that we had one out now, so it might be well to send him to where his expenses wouldn't be too great. So they said that if they sent him off in the islands, that that would be about the cheapest mission there was. Uh, so they sent him to the Cook Islands, and uh, that, I suppose, that there was no better mission to send a person who was low on money than the Cook Islands. Part of the time there, the boat didn't come in, so he never got any check at all. And he said that the folks were wonderful and hospitable, and uh, you could have anything that they had, and their living come quite easy to them. And he enjoyed himself while he was there, learned to climb coconut trees and fish. And he, I think of no place that he could thought of that he would enjoy going like he did to the Cook Islands. Harold got sent off to Holland. I don't know if that was his choice. I never did hear him say anything about it, but his mother was quite pleased to have him go there because she said that was his, uh, the home of his, uh, some of his ancestors. So we got a great deal of joy out of all of our children and the accomplishments they've done. And I, I would like to say for one thing, when I got my patriarchal blessing, I was told that as I would be dutiful, my children would be dutiful unto me. Now, I told you before that I didn't seem to have amounted to anything spectacular in this life, but I do think that my children have been as good as I have, and they never never caused us any concern much about whether they were doing as they should. If they'd done things they shouldn't, it was kept from their parents. 
we've always had a great deal of satisfaction knowing we could trust our children wherever we sent them and they've been kind and considerate to us. I should like to say that Douglas told his mother that he was kind of figured on going on a foreign mission, but he was called to the New England states. But after he'd been there a while, they sent him off up into Nova Scotia and Canada. So he may have got uh, enough foreign mission to suit him, but he hadn't been out very long when he wrote home, and he said he was progressing quite well with the language. So I, I think maybe he had all the joy and satisfaction that if his mission had easy gotten anywhere. As far as Jim was concerned, I never did hear him say whether he wanted to go any certain place or not, but I think he was more inclined to go if they called him and go where, where they called him. And he seems to be enjoying his mission very much and will be home in June. He was called to the Northern States Mission. I'd like you to, I'd like you to tell us about uh, your brothers and you getting the ground in Marion and uh, what led up to it, if you'd like. Well, that was done without me knowing much about it. All the groundwork was laid before I was old enough to realize what was going on. But I remember when the reservation was thrown open for homesteading. Well, I don't know if it was right then, but I remember coming home from school one day, and my brother Milo had just driven into his place, and he'd been then to see about homesteading on the reservation. That was in, in 1906. Then in between then and 1910, Milo, George, and Joseph, and Willard had all gone out into Wyoming. They put four horses on a white top and, and traveled around through uh, western Wyoming, around in Laramie. I don't know how much area they covered. They never did talk to me much about it. But in 1910, in 1914, uh, they went into Nevada, uh, Idaho, and Wyoming. Sometimes they'd, two of them would go together. Sometimes if they'd Brother uh, Moses W. Taylor was a real estate man, and he was president of the Summit Stake at that time. And he came to our place uh, a few times, and stay, he'd stay for a, a night or two and talk real estate with Father. But I didn't, I didn't know much about any area except right there in Salt Lake Valley at that time. But then I know they went down into Ruby Valley in Nevada to see some property that President Taylor had. But they finally ended up in going up into into Camas Valley and buying a place there. Really, I should have uh, an insert there. Before they went into Camas Valley to buy that place, James Hoagland had come down from, that was my sister Mary's husband, James T. Hoagland, had come down from Idaho and uh, talked to the folks uh, sufficiently that they decided to buy a place out in Snyderville. And they bought 160 acres in Snyderville, but uh, for some reason he never did come down to possess it. The folks kept it for a few years, then George Staley, who was a neighbor to that property, he came and bought it. And that ended, maybe it didn't end the desire for property, but it ended the, the contact they had in Snyderville. But I suppose then they kept on going with the same idea of getting land and, and then got the place in, in Camas Valley. Uh, the the property that they had in Snyderville we never did live on only just in the summertime a little bit to hay or irrigate there was a small uh, frame building put up on it 
but and the hay was stacked. Then Joseph would go out in the in the fall and bale it up and haul it either through from Snyderville to Salt Lake on wagons, or else haul it to Golgorza and put it on the train on the railroad and ship it in. Then we would unload it when it came into Murray or Sugar House. How did he bale it? I didn't think you had baling machines. Well, it was baled with a with a stationary baler. A stationary baler with a team was so the way hay was baled at that time. You never did bale only as you brought the hay to the baler. It was done a real good job of baling. You could make them, your hay was always dry and it was baled up real tight. Bales, they aimed to make them around 85 to 100 pounds, but sometimes they'd get them up to 135. So I've seen them 150. What did you wrap them with? Uh, it was always done with with uh, what they call baling wire. How was it powered? Well, I suppose you don't know anything about running a thrashing machine with horses either, do you? No, I don't. <laughs> well, uh, when, when I was young, thrashers come around through the country to do your thrashing, and they had six teams. The biggest ones did. They may have had smaller ones, I suppose, uh, as they developed through, but the bigger thrashers had six teams, and they worked in a circle. And they, and that uh, was the, what they, uh, these horses turned a, a steel rod that went back to the thrasher and, ru and run the thrasher, same as it's, it was run with a steam engine with a belt. But the baler, the hay baler was run with one team, and they just continually worked around on a, what we called a sweep that was a big timber that was stuck out for the, to hitch them to from this uh, pivot that ran the power for the baler. Tell us about which brothers were in Marion and all that history. Well, when they first bought the place, I was still going to school, but Willard had graduated from the high school, and he and my brother Milo and George were the first ones to go out there to take care of it. George took his wife, his that was his second wife, Leona Porter, and Milo didn't stay there very long. He never did move his family out there. Uh, but George stayed, I don't know exactly how long George stayed, but he, he was made bishop long after he went out.